God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now over to chapter 3, please, for verse 5. Uh, this is Satan speaking to Eve, the serpent speaking to her, beguiling her. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And now chapter 11 for verse 4. As we have this people group migrating from where they were to Shinar. And verse 4, they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, from the first book of the Bible to the last book of the Bible, please. Just two verses. First of all, chapter 4, verse 8. And we'll just take the second part of the verse. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And now to chapter 13, just for verse 15. Uh, it says it was given to him, and in the context that's to the false prophet, to give breath to the image of the beast. And in the context, the beast here is the Antichrist. So the false prophet is given the permission to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And then there's the control that's mentioned further in verse 16. It was back in the 1950s that a Stanford University professor coined the term artificial intelligence. It's a branch of computer science and it's dedicated to the mimicking of human intelligence by machines. Late last year, the uh, British Broadcasting Corporation reported on how teachers in the UK were using AI to mark their class test papers and, or, and also to prepare lessons. And speaking to people who are uh, graphic designers, including some in my own family, they are routinely using AI and its generative capabilities built into designer software such as Photoshop, etc. In fact, we're probably all using AI in some form as we do searches on the internet, maybe not even consciously aware of it initially, that AI has taken over and it's helping us to do the search. And of course, there's Alexa, uh, a chatbot, so-called, that's an example of a computer program featuring, technically speaking, language learning modules that allow it to simulate human conversation. So prevalent these days, I read about one young couple whose newborn grew up and its first word was Alexa, because <laughs> it's the most commonly spoken word in many households, perhaps. Well, for at least um, the last half century, School children, school students, have been used to being taught how to program a machine and do computer uh, studies in order to solve arithmetical problems uh, much more quickly than we can do it and more accurately, accurately than we can do it. In fact, I, I feel as I stand here saying that, um, that I almost go back to the ark because in the days when I was taught to do this in high school, I had to punch out the cards and then send them away in a batch job to a mainframe computer that occupied a huge building on part of the university campus. And in those days, they, you felt that you were in control of the machine. It was doing what you asked it to do. I don't know that I was always in control of the printed card machine because sometimes it would come back after three days and there would be a simple syntactical error and you'd have to repunch a card and then put it back again. So you folks that are into quick debugging these days, you're, you're, you don't know how well off you are. So machines, of course, are now being developed that are not only far faster at doing things than we are, but they're also much smarter than us in the sense that they can easily beat the best of us, say, at chess. Having once 
taught them how to analyze moves, they can go on to do this analysis of moves an awful lot faster than we can. And that artificial speed of thought makes them to be, in that sense, smarter than we are. A prominent uh, neuroscientist, Christoph Koch, foresees uh, a fast approaching time, he says, when the boundary between carbon-based human intelligence and silicon-designed artificial intelligence will become very difficult to detect. I think his words were it would become porous. But he says there would be this difference, and the difference would be the AI variety will be flawlessly creative. Flawlessly creative. And in support of that, he would reference us to what is simply known now as Move 37. You can Google it, and you can go on YouTube, and you can see Move 37. It was a move in the second match that was played between AlphaGo and Lee Seedall, one of the greats at playing the ancient strategy game known as Go. Um, I've never played Go, but I have played Othello, and it's just a much more complex version, a strategy board game, much more complex than Othello. And so this great context was, uh, this contest was set up between the machine AlphaGo and the one who was ranked probably the best in the world at that time, Lee Seedall. And uh, I think the machine beat on four games to one. Uh, in this particular game, the second game, Move 37 has been described by the experts in the game as an unimaginable move in the 3,000 year history of this ancient strategy game, Go. So because it was unimaginable, that shows that move was not humanly scripted. And so that just shows how this machine, AlphaGo, had worked it out from its initial algorithm training and the input of lots of data. This type of AI, this type of artificial intelligence, is therefore not about simulating human conversation as such, but simulating human learning by extracting facts from the data and using them to improve its own performance. That's an amazing capability that we've built into these machines now. AI was, of course, developed to help us with the huge amount of data that we generate these days. And it works by taking in data and applying algorithms. Now, an algorithm is just a, a set of instructions, a set of guidelines that it uses. And by means of that, it analyzes the data that's input to it in order to detect patterns in the data. And by detecting those patterns, it reaches conclusions based on evidence and reasoning. So AI mimics the functioning of the human brain by using today's vast computational processing power and storage capability. Now, as reported in Scientific American on the 25th of May last year, one of Google's top artificial intelligence experts said that the algorithms used by these machines will soon reach a point of rapid self-improvement that threatens our ability to control them. He said this, the idea that this stuff could actually become smarter than us. I thought, he said, it was way off. Obviously, I no longer think that. So AI is becoming increasingly able to improve itself without human intervention by improving the technique of getting it to learn from its own mistakes. That's often how we learn, isn't it? We learn from our mistakes. And these artificial intelligent machines are now able to learn from their own mistakes. For example, Google's AI learned how to play chess better than the very best human just nine hours after it had been turned on. And it did that by analyzing 
its moves and its mistakes through playing itself millions of times over. Self-improvement. At the heart of what is called general AI is this ability to learn. A prime example of machine learning that I think we're all familiar with in terms of its output is the teaching of computers to learn how to identify images, such as learning to recognize human faces. During the training phase, programmers um, feed into the computer millions of images of human faces. And the machines are taught to expect certain properties of these faces, such as the distance between eyes and distance between ears. And by that process of training and inference, an AI program can become better and better at recognizing the properties relevant to recognizing a particular face. AI can also be trained to analyze anomalies in x-rays. And that can speed up the whole process of a patient getting an accurate diagnosis. So these are the advantages of AI in modern society. Sometimes there are disadvantages. Uh, the New York Times reported in one of its columns recently that in China, the authoritarian state has been investing in um, millions of surveillance cameras and billions of lines of code in order to use AI to more efficiently track and identify its 1.4 billion populace. So that raises the specter that was there maybe in the dystopian novels of Aldous Huxley and George Orwell, and there's almost something potentially apocalyptic in this vision of things and the way that we're heading. Hinton and Koch, as quoted earlier, both hint at this migration from what is known as narrow AI to general AI. And that brings us to the concept of transhumanism. The fluidity between carbon-based life and silicon-designed life, in adverted commas. So here's a link with the last topic I spoke about. We were thinking about the medically enhanced design of humans, but now we're talking about the technologically enhanced design of humanity in a sense, in terms of silicon designed artificial life. The goal of the latter is homo deus. It's back to what we saw in Genesis chapter three and verse five. Humanity has long had the desire to be as God. And here we're talking about becoming as a transhuman God without morals and also via deep fake technology fact that truth itself can so easily now be undermined. Our thoughts are not God's thoughts, Isaiah says in chapter 55, but from the dawn of creation, humanity has wanted to be God-like. Similar to when humanity set out to build a tower or ziggurat, its top reached even to heaven, present day confidence in human achievements and accomplishments is overblown, perhaps, but certainly misguided. We have now facilitated machines being able to learn new rules from data rather than having the rules written by expert programmers. That's an awesome feat. That's an amazing thing that these machines can learn new rules from the data that's fed into them. But marvelous as that ability is, it does remind us of their inherent limitation. I'd like us to underscore for the next few minutes the differences between artificial intelligence and almighty intelligence, the intelligence of our intelligent designer. Because our intelligent designer has no need to learn anything. Isaiah chapter 40, and verses 13 and 14 tell us that no one has taught God at any time. No one has ever been his counselor. Neither does God learn anything by looking into the future. He doesn't look into the future 
and see that one day you would believe in him and in his son and therefore chose you from the beginning in advance. No, God doesn't look into the future and learn anything. He's the omniscient God. God does not need to learn anything. He is all-knowing and sovereign, as we've been hearing, and he doesn't learn things by looking into the future. You know, secondly, in testing, one chatbot performed better than 90% of humans in a standardized test used in the US to certify lawyers for being able to enter into practice. That's no political or pejorative comment against US lawyers, but it's really extolling the ability, the reasoning ability of AI machines these days. Because most of these tests were about reasoning, testing the powers of reasoning. Come and let us reason together, God says in Isaiah 1 and verse 18. Our God is a reasonable God. He's a rational being. As proper scientific study of all God's works demonstrates, Psalm 111 verse 2, God is a rational being who made us in his own image. You know, think about the, the worldview that's so prevalent today. If we were just a small part of a cosmic accident, then we should never be able in our minds to describe reasonably and fairly realistically, as we believe, the workings of the universe at large. How could one small bit of a cosmic accident be able to have an appreciation and a description of what's going on in the cosmos at large. But the creator who made the stars also made our minds and gave us that capability of in some measure being able to think God's thoughts after him as the devout Kepler once said. Thirdly, we could ask the question, is there anything that AI machines cannot do well, the clue is in the question. Machines are about doing, not about being. God declares that he simply is. In heaven, as we read in Revelation 4 and verse 8, he is worshipped as the God who was and who is and who is to come or will be. He exists without change. You know, if you wanted to go to a chapter in Isaiah that showcases the holiness of God, God's holiness is his otherness, his difference from us and from everything else. Well, I would say you shouldn't just go to Isaiah chapter 6, but why not Isaiah chapter 45? Because nine times in that chapter, God's speaking to the pagan Messiah Cyrus. He says, I am the Lord. And there is no other. There is none besides me. That's the essence of God's holiness. I am the Lord and there is no other. You know, there's a story that goes like this. Indulge me in this. There's a, a Greek who goes into a Greek tailor shop. And he puts a set of torn trousers on the counter. And he says, Eumenides? And the guy behind the counter looks up inquiringly and says, Euripides? <laughs> so now you all know two Greek names. But I want to mention a different two Greek names. Those of Parmenides and Heraclitus. The first, they're both philosophers. The first was famous for observing. Just three words, but with a comma. He said... And it sounds too simple, but it's profound. He said, what is, is. You got it? What is, is. And the other, Heraclitus says, he's famous for this saying, you can't jump into the same river twice. Because when you jump in the second time, the water that you first jumped in is now 500 meters down towards the sea. So... These things point out the difference between God, the God who exists, who just is without change, and everything else 
including ourselves, who are constantly in a state of flux. As the hymn says, we change, he changes not. Machines can do, but they cannot be. Yahweh is the God who is, and he is not just the supreme being. Technically, he is the only being. We are becomings. We are in a state of flux. God is, and he is the only being. Fourthly, AI machines can't exhibit consciousness. They can only simulate intelligence without consciousness. They can have no true consciousness because consciousness is the feeling of being alive. Consciousness is experience. It can't be computed. Consciousness is the, the title of a book by one of the world's leading neuroscientists says is the feeling of life itself. Well, you know Ezekiel chapter 37, them bones, them dry bones in the valley there. And then as Ezekiel is watching, there comes sinews and then flesh and then skin upon those bones. But they're still inert. They're still inanimate until the breath of God comes and gives life to them. That's the difference, the essential difference between us and a machine. Consciousness is a God-given thing. It's something that the best of scientists today still can't even understand. And then there's subjective experience. We, like our creator, can experience grief and hurt. But we can also sing for joy, like God himself in Zephaniah 3 and verse 17, over his redeemed. What a wonderful picture there of God singing for joy over the redeemed. You know, AI machines, I guess, can become relational to some extent, allowing themselves at least to be perceived as liking us or trusting. But this, again, is fake, really, isn't it? It's a mere simulation of being human-like. By contrast, we delight in a God who exists in the profoundest of relationships, as we've been hearing. One God and three persons. John the Apostle in 1 John 4 and 8 says, very simply, God is love. And really that encompasses the fact that God exists in a relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One person on a remote, deserted desert island, all by himself, can't experience love. Because love is about relationships. So even the statement of scripture that says God is love is introducing us to the great truth of the Trinity. The God who is both one and three in different ways. God is one in a different sense from that in which he is three. There's no contradiction. And wonder of wonders. He's the God who wants to be in a relationship with you and me. But what can we say then about the morality of an AI machine? Can they be moral? Well, they can, in a sense, learn to mimic human moral behavior, as learned from their integrated algorithms. For instance, self-driving cars need to be trained how to respond in, at some point, an inevitable crash scenario. Should those self-driving vehicles be programmed to minimize the number of deaths? Well, you say, sure, that's obvious, let's, let's do that. Should they be programmed to prioritize the lives of their own occupants in that car? We get into more difficult questions, into moral issues. But that's indeed just a pale reflection of the, the God who made us to be moral beings in his own image, as we've been emphasizing today, his moral creation. You know, everything about these machines is artificial, as the name suggests. But finally, in teasing out these differences between artificial intelligence and almighty intelligence, we might come to the thought that we design and train AI to be reductionist and, and rational, but they can't possess vulnerability. They can't be ethically uh, responsible and answerable to one another. Machines can't suffer. But the supreme 
intelligent designer has done just that, of course, in suffering the just for the unjust. You know, I'll never forget driving home to Scotland around Christmas time in 1988. My route took me past the Scottish border town of Lockerbie, where days before Pan Am 103 had been blown out of the sky by a terrorist bomb and 270 people lost their lives, including local inhabitants. And I was tuned as I was driving into the BBC and uh, I'll never forget hearing a BBC reporter at Lockerbie on site turn on the local minister, whether it was a Church of Scotland minister or not, I forget, but he, he turned on the local minister and almost spat out the words, where is your God now? But I'll not forget the calm, reassured reply of that minister who said, God has joined us in suffering. It was Edward Shilato who observed the horrors of World War I and he wrote the poem, Jesus of the Scars. I don't know if you know it, but there's one line that says, to our wounds, only the wounds of God can speak. The intelligent designer, the supreme almighty intelligence, allowed himself to be vulnerable and to suffer on our behalf. And so, summing up this part, what we're saying is, transhuman, godlike AI cannot possess being and cannot come to an end of learning as a process and can't possess consciousness, morality, or even become truly relational or vulnerable, nor capable of subjective experiences. Society resists the idea of an intelligent designer who sets the rules that we must abide by. We are unable to negotiate them. This claim to sovereignty violates our demand or right as perceived to determine our own fate, as Henley, we saw earlier, declared. Christians, of course, should be free from such illusions, but we may sympathize with a not totally dissimilar aversion to ceding control to AI machines that we have made. As AI keeps on improving itself, we've no way of knowing what it will do. We won't be able to control them because anything we can think of, they can think of so much faster than us. Any task like developing a new weapon system or a, a new aircraft, they'll be able to do it in seconds. Mind-boggling stuff. It will also have the capacity to act in the virtual world through its electronic connections. And also in the physical world through robotic connections. And that may lead Christians, some of you among us here, to forgo working in that particular field. Narrow AI accepted, maybe. But in any case, we rest free from alarm and the assurance that nothing outside of God's will can take place. That's God's will in its broadest sense. There are three wills of God in scripture, but God's will in its broadest sense, nothing can happen outside of God's will because God is sovereign. And if anything could happen outside of his will in its broadest sense, then God would not be sovereign. So God is in control. Even if the world seems to be spiraling into this brave new world, Let's not be afraid. God is in control. But it does seem quite likely, I suggest, that the Antichrist could well employ this kind of technology to gain a large measure of global control, which the scripture says he's going to be able to wield. The book of Revelation, as we've read, talks about the image of the beast. Man-made biotechnology that has the ability to speak and to control the lives of humans around it. If such is the case then, present societal concern is warranted. And at this point, the topic here today perhaps integrates or converges with the topic I've been following in the series of meetings in Brantford about prophetic events. Might the beast's image 
be an AI monster? Is the mystery of lawlessness the mystery of spiritual lawlessness? And is that this matter of transhumanism? I think it was Putin that was recorded as saying, whoever controls AI will control the world. I don't know if Putin reads the Bible, but the Bible I read speaks about a God, the God, who became human in Jesus Christ. Humanity is special because God himself became one of us. The word that expresses the mind of the great creator, the intelligent designer, became flesh in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, humanity is at a crossroads. Whether to embrace truth incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ, or to embrace that which is deep fake, satanic deception, with its transhuman echoes of Eden. And I think the choice will get starker yet. Whether to believe the God of truth, the God who is truth, the God of the Amen, Psalm 31 verse 5. Or to believe a deluding influence that will be sent upon the world in time soon to come so that those who reject God's truth will believe the lie, as 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 11 says. What will that lie be? The lie. Is it bound up with this whole concept of transhumanism, the old satanic deception of you can be as God? Well, my concluding appeal to you would simply be this, that we don't need to fear man, and we don't need to fear man-made machines. But we should come in fear and trembling to the goodness of God. I've gone to love that verse recently in Hosea 3 and verse 5. They came in fear and trembling to the goodness of God. And so we conclude by emphasizing the strap line for this section. We've had God as creator, God as sovereign. This is God as truth as distinct from deep fake technology. This is the God who is truth. Thank you for listening.